that I think this is a very interesting moment in science, especially in material science, because um, for the first time in a long time, more than a generation at least, the material is going to be a very critical part of many of the sort of global challenges that we face. And um, that hasn't been the case for a long time. So that excites me a lot. And nano, what happens at the nanoscale is, is part of that. I mean, this is the definition I actually like. It's the purposeful engineering of matter at scales of less than 100 nanometers to achieve size-dependent properties and functions. And I like three things about this. The first, if you click, is that it's purposeful. It's not nano by accident. So there's nanotechnology in everything because everything, after all, is made out of atoms. Um, but, but, but when we talk about nano in kind of the research community, and I would have hoped in, in companies, although that's certainly not the case, um, we talk about it being for a reason. We're doing it to get to achieve some property that's interesting. Um, okay, so the next thing is that it's small, and I'll tell you why this scale is interesting. Um, and, and, um, and then the final thing is that the properties are, are size dependent, stuff like that. And then you go to like the, the mall or, or something, and, um, and so if you go to the next page, you, and you see this. And you know, there's, there's almost nothing with nano. I mean, this is, as somebody mentioned, this is gonna get banned probably sometime soon. You do have it in tennis rackets. I have Eddie Bauer's nano pants. They're a little bit more stain resistant. Not that much. You know, the tennis balls seem to last a little longer. So there's a real gap, right? And, and I think that's because it's still a piece of silicate, which is what Silicon Valley likes. You know, it's called a bulk material. And it turns out, if you click and look at it, it's kind of boring to look at. It looks kind of like charcoal, okay? But now you take your nano ice cream scooper and you scoop out a, a little nano-sized piece of that. It turns out that's called a quantum dot. But all it is is a smaller piece of the same material, okay? And you look at that thing, which is just this thing but smaller, and you click once more, then it becomes really interesting to look at, and you can change its color, okay? And what, so, so what we've done is we've changed the property of a material just by changing its size, okay? Well, why is that? In this case, it's because of something called quantum effects, which I'm going to have one slide, no equations, where I'm gonna explain it. So if you click to the next slide, it's because when you shine light on this, so go ahead and click, then what you do is you actually do what's called an excitation. And let me just very quickly explain what I mean. So if you go ahead and click again, you, you shine light on it, what you do is you, you, you excite an electron in a hole. And all you need to know is that those are charges. But see, charges like a plus charge and a minus charge are very quantum mechanical kinds of things. And that's why we call this a quantum effect. Well, that's fine. And these things, it turns out, when they're excited, like to stay a certain distance apart from one another uh, before they recombine. Okay, so that's, that's, okay, who cares? Except that now when we go to our quantum dot and you do the same thing, these very quantum mechanical things, if you click again, are trying to be far apart, but they can't. They're literally just run out of real estate because the thing is too small. And so you're confining these quantum mechanical things, if you click again, to be inside of where they can be, which is the material itself. And by doing that, you are doing something called quantum confinement, so you're confining these quantum mechanical things. By doing that, you change the color. And so now, if you click once more, we have the fact that physical confinement um, leads to a change in the color of, of this thing. And that's really sort of weird in a way. It's like, it's like saying that I'm gonna take a really small piece of this stool and it's not gonna be red anymore. Okay, and notice that I just changed the size, I make it smaller and I can change the color. Well, this size range that this happens in, where I have these quantum mechanical effects, happens to be exactly the size range of the building blocks of life. So proteins mostly are in this kind of three to 20 nanometer range, and DNA is only three nanometers across. Um, and so what can you do? Well, you can do things like, like have different color quantum dots that some of which can go inside of cells, others of which can stay in the, in the membrane. And you can study how proteins and cells and other kinds of bio uh, uh, biomaterials react when, for example, they're exposed to a certain drug, and you can study them now in much, much The anode of a battery with nanoparticles, you're not changing the anode, you're not changing the volume or the weight really hardly at all, you're changing the surface area of that anode, and you can increase the charge time by a factor of 10. Actually, 
uh, just a, a, a week ago, um, people using this same kind of idea were able to get uh, almost full charge of a battery in something like nine seconds. And that made it on the hydroelectric. Right? We're pretty much tapped out, like I said. We're at about one and a half. We're close to one and a half terawatts, which is all you, you're not going to, you need certain levels of, and volumes of water. Um, to take advantage of hydroelectric. So the next one is geothermal, which is a very interesting one, where you, you, you take heat from the ground, from underground, and you can convert it. And if you look at all those spots sort of in the world that are close to the shore, close enough to the shore, where we think we can do that, you get about this. This is even looking at cost, okay? And the next one is wind, and this is something a lot of people debate, but it's not gonna go that much higher. This has to do with where there are certain class winds uh, around the, the world. Um, and and um, this would go up if you could make wind turbines that turn on at lower speeds. That would be a big breakthrough. Um, okay, uh, biomass. If you stop eating globally and plant uh, a fuel in every arable acre of land today, you would still only have about five to seven terawatts. And so the thing that I think is interesting is when you compare the sun, and uh, so the next one, and you see that the potential from the sun is is more than you know, 50 times all of these other uh, resources. So actually, the, let's see, if you click one more, some of you may have heard this quote, but in one hour, enough energy from the sun strikes the earth to power the whole planet for a year. So that's an incredible resource. So if you so go to the next, these things are coming down. If you click once more, you see, these are all biomass, solar thermal, geothermal wind. These are all kind of coming somewhat into line with uh, coal and gas and oil. Um, they're kind of approaching that. They're still expensive, but solar is way too expensive. Solar is, 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 is much too much. And even with a lot of subsidies, it's too much for most people to access. So we have the greatest potential and the least use. It's the least used green sliver energy source compared to these other. What's exciting, so this kind of gets into how a solar cell works. What's exciting about nanotechnology for me is that you know, it, it, it completely changes the game of how you can even make solar cells. So you can now make solar cells out of totally different materials than you ever thought were possible. Um, because you can control them and manipulate them at this scale, and you can make them out of much cheaper materials than, than what we have today. So you might It turns out that solid. silicon is a really good solar cell. It can do this thing where it takes light and it changes it into charge. <laughs> which sure. is what you want. It's okay. And, and uh, but you know what the, the problem is that it's it's hard to make silic silicon is a really bad absorber of light, okay, and because of that you have to make it very thick so that it can absorb the sunlight efficiently. Well, okay, say so, well that's fine, but then the problem is if you make it thick, then the charges that have to get out of there to power your light bulb or whatever um, have to travel farther, and they have to travel farther without running into problems and in a material a problem is a defect or something that you know some some change in the crystal and so what what that means is that you have to make these thick layers of silicon that are very pure and that's that's what's so expensive um, and and so so it so so once you understand that then you start if you go to the next slide then you start to say well hang on we have these materials where we completely tune their optical properties and how they absorb light maybe those could be used in some of these key steps in making a solar cell. Um, and so that's exactly what's happening. So if you go, um, so there are completely new constructs of solar cells that are being made, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but these are already commercialized. Um, I think it's too early to commercialize them because I think they're really still research, they're at a research level, um, but they're very promising. If you go a couple more slides, one more. This is, this is a very busy chart, but if you, make, if you work on solar cells and you think you have something new, this is, this is what you pull out in a dark alley with your competitor. And this is something NREL does every year or two. They, they, they rate all of the efficiencies of all the kind of serious solar cells on the market. And, um, and you notice that they're all going up, which is great. Um, you know, versus time. The, 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 this, this blue one here is what we buy at Home Depot right now. And um, I'm sorry, actually, it's the, the white squares. It's the polycrystalline silicon. You see it's going up, but it's not going up that fast. Um, what I think is really exciting are these red ones, because these are based on nanoscience and nanotechnology. And, and the fact of the, the, what's exciting about them is that they're 10 times cheaper to make. But the problem is they're just not that efficient. This is the efficiency. And unless you're above like 15 or so, you, don't, you can't put them on your rooftop and power your house. Um,
question so, then so is silicon can... solar cells, which is again about 90 something percent of anything you can get today, that there's this problem that you need a lot of the material because it absorbs light really badly. And, and so, but, but since you need a lot of it, it has to be really pure. And what you can do with nanomaterials is you can make completely different constructs of solar cells where you have actually two materials in them. Uh, one that absorbs the light and the other that carries the electrons out. And so uh, by doing that, um, you actually have many more choices in what you can do. You're not just stuck with one piece of material. And so you can blend, in this case actually, uh, buckyballs, fullerenes, with uh, a polymer. And that is very cheap. There's no high temperature processing no vacuum deposition, um, you just blend it. And you get about a 6% solar cell. Um, and I've what actually held it, and it's, it's, a, it's a wallet, and it unfolds into this big, huge sheet, and you can plug it into your cell phone, and after two hours of sunlight, you get like five minutes of talk time. Um, <laughs> they're very, very 15% efficiency rate, would we be done? Would we be like, and, no. and, and it's, and it's the right price. We got everything yeah. like right on the chart. Would we be done or we still have problems? Well, if it's a solar cell, you know, then you, you do have still some serious issues. Um, um, you know, so one thing is you want it to be a technology that can both be maybe used residentially, but also could be grid compatible. And that means other things, um, but but one thing that it, it means a lot of things. One thing that it means is to be able to uh, match the the sort of spikes in demand that happen in, on the grid. Um, and it turns out that solar doesn't do that right now. Um, and, and so when we tend to want electricity most is not when a solar farm will generate most. We need to store it, and for other reasons. What is the scientific community doing about nanotoxicity? Yeah. It's a fantastic question. I, I mean, I, I think they're starting to understand. I, I can tell you that there is a lot of funding now. Uh, there are whole centers, millions, millions of dollars a year type centers devoted to toxicity and exposure. Um, some have been around for a while. There are many new ones coming. The National Science Foundation is sort of leading this effort. They're taking the charge in this. Um, I think what's missing right now is the dialogue um, where everybody sits at the table. What I saw happen in Berkeley with the, the referendum on, on nanoparticles, you know, I knew some of the authors of that. I, I think the problem there, and the reason why the university has refused to, to even look at it, basically, is that it wasn't really something that was done with everyone at the table. There were no scientists involved in talking about that. I think scientists would be interested in talking about that, but I think they need to be more encouraged to. Um, so it's it's a it's a very important problem. I think you know this is a, I, I mean we we we've, we've met this cost benefit question many many times in the past, and and you're absolutely right. I think often we go too quickly. I, I would say that the scientists though don't. <laughs> We're usually a very conservative group. We usually um, uh, peer review things you know for years before we believe it. Um, I think that the problem comes in taking that out and going to market because we see enormous potential for money. Um, and, and, but I think that what you're seeing in the discussion happening now about this cost benefit of, you know, well, this could save the world, oh, but it also we don't know about all of its toxicity. Um, I think that's a very healthy one. I, I've talked to people in the FDA. I think things are progressing in a way that is actually very responsible right now. Um, I think halting research would be a huge mistake. If you really, I mean, cost is one thing, but if you want to think about CO2 abatement, the best way to think about it is in reducing your demand. There's no question about it. It's not going to be on the supply side for 10 or 15 years at least. The best and easiest and quickest way is to do things like what that gentleman is saying. Have, have things that cycle your appliances. Um, you know, our cars now have hundreds of computers in them. Our house has nothing. Our house has no operating system, no computer. Nothing is actually trying to control, maybe that person has one, but most houses don't. But, you know, but in, you know, so this is a very important point. All the work I do is on the supply side, which I hope will come into view uh, in terms of the CO2 problem in, in, in a while from now. But right now, a lot can be done. And it's all on the demand side. And one more thing I want to say is on the global energy use, it's absolutely right that your home only uses about 10%. One thing that's interesting about those numbers 
is that 56% of the energy we generate with these, you know, by preciously burning fossil fuels and, and releasing all this dirty stuff, 56% is wasted to heat. We're just heating the world, you know, the air. Um, and so that's another place where there, there, there's just such an enormous opportunity to recover inefficiencies, right? When do you think you'll have nano-driven technology, especially in the solar realm, that will be competitive with other technologies that already exist? Can you sort of show the red curve? Yeah, but uh, there's two parts of that. There, yeah, sure. There are no questions. This is a very open-ended question for Jeff to kind of conclude with. Well, I think, you know, carbon taxes will certainly drive some of the other prices up. But I think that um, um, I don't think we're looking at very far from now uh, for cost-effective solutions. I think we may be looking at farther than that for um, cost-effective solutions that uh, that have abundant uh, abundant materials under them. So some of these, you know, there are solar cells now that you can buy that are actually very cost-effective based on nano something, um, but they're not based on something that can scale to a global sort of global needs. Um, so uh, I would say we're, we're sort of already almost at that point. Uh, maybe in the next five years we'll definitely be at that point where uh, companies like Selexin will be making solar cells you can buy and, and maybe put on your rooftop. Um, I think we need a little bit more work, though, maybe another 10 or 15 years to identify um, the right materials that are actually you know, super abundant and can scale to the challenges that are posed to us by things like CO2, global warming and uh, energy.